It's 2023, and although we have seen an absolute ton of old school stuff returning, there's still a lot that's just kind of gone, and some of it really just shouldn't be. Hi folks, it's Falcon, and today on Game Ranks, 10 things video games shouldn't have abandoned. Starting off with number 10, extreme sports minigames. Like, where have all the minigames gone? There's an argument to be made that these things are a drain on developer resources and could be better utilized elsewhere, but I mean, come on. A few mini games can really add some variety, especially with how much AAA games are ballooning in size. If I'm going to spend hundreds of hours playing your game, give me something else to do. Maybe this is just a personal thing, but the extreme sports mini games and stuff like Final Fantasy VII or Spyro the Dragon were really some of the best. Like, the snowboard part in Final Fantasy VII isn't going to compete with SSX, but it's a really cool breakup in the gameplay. It's something that just isn't like anything else in the game, and, well, there's actually a lot of that in Final Fantasy VII. It's not all extreme sports, but the fact that there is some extreme sports when you're up on a snowy hill and you probably at least think of snowboarding at least once during that whole sequence, it kind of makes sense. And no, I'm not saying it really, really, really makes sense or anything, but in the terms of the world, you think about it and hey, also you can do it and it's fun. <laughs> The Spyro skateboarding game was actually pretty legit, and it's easily my favorite minigame in Spyro 3. Remember the skateboard mode in Metal Gear Solid 2? That was actually amazing. Technically, it was basically a demo for Konami's Evolution Skateboarding, but that game was nothing to write home about, but skating around Big Shell as Snake, <laughs> it's funny in a way, but it's also just a lot of fun and cool looking. These old games weren't afraid to get a little goofy and janky at times, and these types of minigames weren't always great or anything, but I definitely miss when games weren't so carefully polished and actually include some rough edges like this intentionally. Half the time games that come out now are just buggy messes seemingly no matter what, so screw it. Why not just have some developers having a lot of fun making a lot of cool stuff that maybe doesn't work perfectly, but it's interesting. It's not like letting a few guys put a skateboard into your game is gonna make that much of a difference. And number nine is Action Hijack. Uh, for a while, it seemed like every game had this feature, so maybe that's why it's less common now. Or maybe devs just collectively decided it looks ridiculous. I, I don't care. It's an awesome feature that pretty much every driving game should have. Action Hijacking is when you steal a car driving another car. Sleeping Dogs has it, Just Cause games basically have it, that Vin Diesel game nobody remembers, The Wheel Man has it. Those Pursuit Force games on the PSP have it. And what else do I need to say? It's awesome. It makes swapping cars so much faster than the normal method of getting out of the car, stopping another car, pulling the person out, accelerating. I don't have time for that. I'm on the clock here. I know it looks absurd. I don't think I have to explain that the physics just go completely out the window when you do this, but it's a video game. It's fun. Isn't that the thing that matters? It's not like you can actually go out and steal a bunch of cars in the way you do in these games and, you know, have that not be your main focus. I mean, I want this feature so I'm able to keep driving in a different car to a destination where I have something to do. There's at least one recent game with some proper action hijacking, but it's just a single level in Modern Warfare 2, the new one's campaign. Yeah, it's fun stealing details while chasing on the world's longest convoy, but this mechanic just isn't the same when it's not an open world game. It is still fun though. And number eight is challenging platforming. And now I know I'm beating a long dead horse here, but most AAA games have completely given up on providing any kind of challenge in their platforming sections. Almost all these games have some kind of climbing, like God of War, uh, Horizon, basically any Assassin's Creed game. I could probably go on a really long time here. And they all have climbing in them somewhere, but it's also automated. It barely serves a gameplay purpose at all. In some cases, it's so automated, it might as well just be a loading screen. Like all you're doing is pressing a button and waiting. For a lot of people out there, 
there, it's fine. Uh, not everybody wants to go back to the days of Tomb Raider, where the most basic jump was life or death. But there is a satisfying middle ground here. Like, pretty much everything on this list, there are exceptions that prove the rule, like Jedi Survivor, which manages to include some interesting platforming sections. But for every game like that, there's a bunch more. We're getting from point A to point B is just so simplified. It's just basically an in-game cutscene, and there's no reason for it at a certain point. Uh, that said, games keep getting it anyway. Uh, if games are going to dedicate a lot of gameplay time to climbing and jumping, they shouldn't have abandoned any semblance of difficulty or even just having it be something, because all it does is make these parts feel like total filler. At number 7 is puzzle dungeons and RPGs. Way back when, the dungeon was the big highlight of playing an RPG. These things were elaborate locations filled with puzzles and challenges, like they were the set piece moments of their time. As games have gotten more complex, however, some dungeons, eh, let's just say, have gotten a lot more basic. And maybe more than some. I'm being kind. In, in all seriousness, look at recent RPGs, including the ones that are mostly throwback. Octopath Traveler 2, Xenoblade Chronicles 3, the Final Fantasy 7 remake, hell, even Final Fantasy 16. They all have pretty linear dungeons that just boil down to a series of fights that culminate in a boss. There are exceptions, obviously. Western RPGs aren't a lot better in that department, but Larian is still knocking it out of the park with dungeon design. And a recent indie game called Chained Echoes has some fun dungeons in it. But for the most part, the bigger RPGs have moved away from the more exploratory elements of their predecessors that essentially make the dungeon into its own puzzle. In order to get past it, you have to find everything in it and put it together in some novel way and I'm not saying that the games I mentioned are bad, or even that linear dungeons are bad. Sometimes it's just nice when they take the approach that requires you to be creative in terms of exploration. At number six, an in-game web browser. It's it's one of those things that doesn't really pop up much anyway, but it's a shame that more modern games still haven't given this idea a shot. Being able to learn more about the world of the game by sitting at a computer, by browsing real, I, fake, fake real. I don't know, sometimes they make the websites in real life, or at least used to when this used to be a thing. But it made the game really immersive and fun without reading a dull encyclopedia of terms, which is kind of rare for games to put in this kind of effort. Like, Grand Theft Auto 4 and 5, of course, do this. They're both great in their own way and have way more work put into them than might appear at first. Cyberpunk 2077 also has an in-game browser, but it's kind of basic and doesn't really try to be immersive, which is pretty disappointing considering the world of cyberpunk. One game that really went nuts with this idea was Front Mission 3 on PlayStation, the original PlayStation. It's set in a science fiction future that's really different from our world, but that doesn't mean the web pages don't have some of the most 90s ass designs I've ever seen. It's still a really cool feature to include, especially because you never actually have to use it. It really has nothing to do with the rest of the game, but it's there and it says something about the world. There are other games that have fake computer interfaces or DOS prompts, but a full in-game browser is an idea that's mostly been abandoned. Hell, at this point, I'm not even sure Rockstar will bring it back for uh, GTA 6. I hope so, but I'm not really that confident in the idea they will. And number five is small open world game. Open world games just keep getting bigger and bigger, and while that can be cool at a point, it does make me miss some of the smaller open world designs of previous generations. You know, games like Crackdown or Infamous, where they're still open world, it's all one big seamless map, but they're not expecting you to play for 100 hours. At least not to experience the whole game. We're in two more block in the harbor entrance of Scrap now. We're not going anywhere, folks. Might as well do whatever you can to get comfortable. Big games are cool and all, but sometimes you just want to play something quick, you know? Like, the AAA space has completely abandoned the idea of small open world game. Everyone that comes out seems like it's trying to get bigger than the last. I mean, Bethesda is describing Starfield as being irresponsibly large. Uh, like, those are their exact words. So, I, I guess maybe it's time to admit these games are just too big. Starfield kind of gets a pass. It's supposed to be huge. That's part of the game. It's a space game. But you get what I'm saying. A and I'll say this, too. At least Assassin's Creed is shrinking 
ranking a little bit with Mirage, but it's one game among many, and also, I don't think that's the permanent state for Assassin's Creed. If it's successful, it'll probably be two types of Assassin's Creed games that come out, the massive epics and the more intimate Mirage-type story. And, and not every big-budget game has to be a huge map. Spider-Man still relatively small in comparison to most of these games, and no one complains about that. That said, anything we're talking about here is always going to have at least a few exceptions, and uh, it's nice that they're good and kind of prove my point. I, it's just, okay, sure, the maps of the open world games could do with some shrink. That's that's the main point, but it's not really what's going on. It's the over-ambition that a lot of these maps have. I'm not saying that all these games have too much stuff in them or too much world in them, because a lot of them are great too. It's just sometimes it's fine to just get dropped into a map and be told to hunt down a bunch of crime bosses, right? Sometimes that's just all that a game needs. Catch me. And number four is secret party members in RPGs. Now, I, I kind of feel like a boomer for saying this because it's been that long, but unlocking a secret character in an RPG just felt awesome. Getting Yuffie and Vincent in Final Fantasy VII was so cool because you could just miss them. They're totally optional and they took some extra effort to unlock and they're both vital for their full story. They're not optional if you want to know everything, but they're optional in terms of actually getting through the game. <laughs> Most RPGs now give you the entire party pretty much right at the start. For telling a story, it makes sense, but it does take some of the fun out of these games. Listen, I know the complaints here. I know that most of the time, secret characters in RPGs are barely characters at all. They get almost no development and have nothing to do with the story, but I don't care. Again, Yuffie and Vincent, Final Fantasy VII, that's an example of it done right. And even if they don't have an interconnected reason to be in the story, they're a tangible reward for your efforts that can make the game way more interesting interesting. At least more interesting than getting a new sword. During the PS1 era, secret characters were all over the place, but as production values increased, these guys eventually stopped showing up. Uh, probably because they're a lot of extra work for not necessarily any extra reward, because a lot of players just miss them completely. Rarely they'll show up in games like Mass Effect 2 or Dragon Age as alternative characters, but for the most part, you're not seeing full-blown secret party members anymore. They do show up rarely, like Chained Echoes had a few few. Xenoblade 3 had a guest character that only unlocked after finishing a bunch of seemingly unconnected quests, but that's basically all I can come up with. RPGs barely even have parties anymore, let alone secret characters, so I guess it should come as no surprise that these things are kind of rare. I still want to see more though. And number three, trolling cheat codes. Cheat codes rare enough themselves these days, but what's even more rare are the fake out cheats that are just there to mess with people. You have to go back a long, long time to find an era where these things were more common. I mean, I'm talking about mid 90s and earlier. We're talking about stuff that's like over 20 years old at this point. The internet was still in its early days. Information was more scarce and fragmented. So it was easier to trick people with codes like these. Like in Hexen, if you put in the doom code, it makes fun of you and then kills you. <laughs> or the Tomb Raider one where it just makes Lara explode. Even a relatively wholesome game like Super Mario RPG got in on the action, only in the Japanese version, but if you put this code into the game, you get a message from Toad congratulating you for finding the secret, and that's it. Nothing happened. The funny thing is, the internet is more and more fragmented, information is harder to find nowadays, and depending on the game, there's major secrets that seem like they should be obvious, but often go years and nobody notices it. I could see this trend coming back. Maybe I'm just old school though, but I don't want games to be so nuts. Sometimes I just want to get blown up after cheating, you know? I think this will give me infinite lives. Oh, my character exploded into many pieces.
And number two is actually cool platform exclusive content. As we see more and more paid exclusives, it just makes me nostalgic for the days when exclusivity didn't feel quite so manipulative. Even when games are multi-platform, there still are certain console exclusive features depending on the game. Call of Duty got PlayStation exclusive content, stuff like that. Uh, I don't know if we're gonna be seeing that anymore, but uh, that's a different topic. These days, that stuff mostly just feels like random bits of content that they arbitrarily make exclusive, uh, but they used to be creative about it. Sometimes games would have exclusive stuff that was custom built for the console. One of the best examples specifically of this is uh, Soul Calibur 2. Depending on which console you bought the game on, you'd get an exclusive character. Uh, PlayStation 2 got Hiachi from Tekken. GameCube got Link. Y yeah, Link, as in Zelda Link. Not exactly a guy you'd expect to witness the body part physics of that game. And uh, Xbox got Spawn, which, okay, why not? It felt like it got a unique version of the game though, and it helped that the new characters were fun. They were actually good. It's not as cool when exclusives were locked with just one version of the game, but that said, like Kratos in Mortal Kombat 9 was an awesome addition, and even came with a new stage. It's kind of uh, uh, hilarious how protective Sony was of the character though. They forced Netherrealm to edit a ton of fatalities so Kratos doesn't look weak, but it doesn't really matter. It's Kratos in a fighting game. The Wii U may not have been the most successful console, but they did have some fun with the exclusives like Mario costumes and Tekken Tag Tournament and Bayonetta. Overall, pretty minor additions, but I'd rather have exclusive content that's added to a game rather than something that's taken out. You know, like how things typically are now when they do that. And finally at number one is airships. The list is a little RPG heavy so far, and well, we're kind of ending it out that way too. But if there's one genre out there that's really abandoned a lot of its previous identity, it's the RPG. I mean, I don't think anyone's howling for new games with random battles or annoying status effects, but there is still some cool stuff in these games I'd really like to see come back, and airships are chief among them. Think back to playing old Final Fantasy games, and some of the best moments are when you finally get the airship. You spent the whole game walking around on foot like a chump, and now you've got an airship. So the world is your friggin' playground. There's triumphant music, no random battles, you got free roam of the map, it's just an awesome feeling. Most modern RPGs especially, JRPGs are kinda missing this big moment when everything frees up. Even ones where you do get an airship like Final Fantasy X, it's kind of a glorified menu where you select the spot to travel to. And with games having fast travel systems and more realistic worlds, it's harder to justify some kind of flying vehicle, but uh, I don't really care how impractical it is. Some games uh, have weirder things that they have to justify, so I don't, I don't know. We're supposed to be next gen, right? Like, why isn't there a game where you can seamlessly get into an airship from ground level and take off? No loading screens, nothing. Kind of like captaining a boat in Assassin's Creed. Specifically Black Flag and, uh, you know, maybe Skull and Bones someday. Uh, if that, I mean, it's not Assassin's Creed, but if that turns out to be a thing at some point. But you know, in RPGs. Anyway, it'd be really cool to maybe get a rebirth of the high wind in Final Fantasy 7 at some point. You, you get my little play around words here because the, the next one's called Rebirth. Okay, I, I do ask for your forgiveness on that one, but if Square Enix really wants to wow people, let us pilot the damn thing. That would be beyond cool. I mean, it's not like a Hindenburg-like incident in the RPG industry had. Why don't we have airships? <laughs> Whoa! This is awesome. Taking the high road. Where we're going, we don't need roads. And that's all for today. Leave us a comment. Let us know what you think. If you like this video, click like. If you're not subscribed, now's a great time to do so. We upload brand new videos every day of the week. And the best way to see them first is, of course, a subscription. So click subscribe. Don't forget to enable notifications. And as always, we thank you very much for watching this video. I'm Falcon. You can follow me on Twitter at Falcon Hero. And we'll see you next time right here on Game Ranks.